Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In November of 1936, a Chicago woman who had been found guilty of murder died in prison. But Tilly Klimek wasn't just a murderer. She also had the uncanny ability to predict the exact day someone would die. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The batteries of numerous vehicles in a family's driveway all go dead at the same time. Two at the same time might be a coincidence. Three would be suspicious. Four dead batteries? combined with the sighting of a shadow person and other bizarre experiences, that has got to be supernatural. The case had gone cold, some say, because of police corruption and a cover-up. But it's heating up again as a new sheriff discovers long-hidden evidence. We'll look inside the Keddie murders. Extraterrestrials and the government. It seems you can't have one without the other. But first, Tilly Klimek had been convicted of only a single murder, but the authorities suspected that she had killed many more, including her three husbands. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. On November 20, 1936, a Chicago woman named Tilly Klimek died in prison. She'd been convicted of only a single murder, but the authorities suspected that she had killed many more, including three of her husbands. But Tilly wasn't just a murderer. She was also a self-proclaimed psychic who was able to determine a person's exact date of death. It was a convenient ability for a woman who killed with poison. She was born Tilly Burrick to immigrant parents in 1865. At a young age, she began working in a Northside sweatshop, a fate shared by many poor inhabitants of Chicago in those days. By the age of 20, Tilly had given up on the idea of ever finding a husband. To be charitable, she was not exactly the sort of girl to attract a man. She was short, broad, muscular, and red-faced, and dressed poorly in mannish-looking clothes. She was said to be a superb cook, however, one of the best in the Little Poland neighborhood, a skill that would someday bring Tilly into the public eye. Eventually, Tilly decided to invest $50 with a marriage broker, who found her a husband, a dully young man named John Mitzkowitz who promptly proposed to her. He was a lazy, shiftless, would-be handyman who knew his prospective wife had a job and was the best cook in the community. So Tilly settled for a man whose best efforts were directed toward starting or recovering from a serious hangover. She put up with it for years, and then, in 1911, she decided that she had had enough. She was tired of being berated by her supervisor neglected by her husband, and taken advantage of by her neighbors. She wanted more, and decided to become a prophet. One hot summer evening, Tilly was sitting on a fire escape with a neighbor woman, and she pointed to a yellow, mongrel dog that was sniffing around for food in the alley below. She told the neighbor that the dog would be dead within a week. When asked how she knew this, Tilly replied, My powers tell me so. 
On the seventh day, the dog was found lying stiff and dead, and Tilly's fabulous career as a seer was begun. Over the course of the next few years, Tilly predicted the deaths of neighborhood cats and dogs with stunning accuracy. As a result, Little Poland learned to respect and fear her. She found the butcher would give her excellent prices on the meat that she bought for her stews when she hinted that evil might befall him if he overcharged her. The Iceman made sure that his deliveries reached Tilly's house first, especially after she mentioned to him that she disliked his product to be melted when it arrived. Men, women, and children went out of their way to be nice to her. In fact, the only person not impressed by Tilly's claims of prophecy was her husband. That, as it turned out, was to be John Mitzkowitz's misfortune. One night, in 1919, Tilly predicted that she would become a widow in the next three weeks. Sure enough, John died. He wasn't even cold yet before Tilly went looking for another husband. She remarried just a few weeks later to laborer John Raskowski. Her second husband dropped dead within three months, leaving her $1,200 in cash and $722 in life insurance. Her next fiancé, Joseph Gazowski, also met Tilly through the same marriage broker. He was a blunt-faced, ugly man who'd been looking for a young and pretty wife. No amount of money was going to help him, and he ended up with Tilly, who was an excellent cook with a fat bank account. He agreed to bring her home on a trial basis before marriage. He was quite taken with her cooking, and eventually he decided to look past her plain appearance and ask her to marry him. Tilly delayed the marriage, though, shortly after finding out that her suitor had no life insurance policy. It wasn't long before she had a premonition of his death. He spent the last two months of his life confined to bed and was buried in the same cemetery as Tilly's first two husbands. Tilly's third husband, Frank Zupchek, was a friendly, easygoing man who worked at the same factory where Tilly had for so many years. For whatever reason, he believed that Tilly was the most attractive woman that he'd ever met. This was a new experience for her. It was the first time that she was married to a man who liked her for herself, not just for her cooking or her money. Many believed that Tilly, at the age of 50, was in love for the first time in her life. But the good times wouldn't last for long. Soon after the wedding, Tilly had a falling out with a young woman, Rose Chudinsky, a distant relative who lived in the neighborhood. Tilly sadly predicted that the young woman wouldn't live much longer. Surprise, she was right. Tilly began making frequent visits to the young woman's home to patch up their disagreement, and Rose died six weeks after the wedding. Strangely, no one suspected Tilly of foul play, or if they did, they knew better than to talk about it. The deaths had simply increased Tilly's reputation as the neighborhood psychic. After Rose's death, Tilly was quiet for a long time. She retired from the factory and stayed home to cook and care for her adoring husband. Just to maintain her reputation, she continued to predict the deaths of dozens of neighborhood dogs and cats. Her predictions, of course, were never wrong. Then, in 1920, she got into arguments with the parents of three small children in the neighborhood. Three children who died, one by one, just as Tilly predicted. Years had passed, and Frank had gotten bored with his wife. he lost interest in her, and rumor had it that he had strayed into another woman's bed. It's probably not a surprise that Tilly had yet another psychic vision that announced that Frank would be dead within eight days. At his funeral, she told a friend, I hope the next husband lasts a little longer. In 1921, Tilly married Joseph Anton Klimek. They were quite happy during the early months of their marriage, but a rift formed over two large dogs that Joseph insisted on keeping in the house. Needless to say, he was heartbroken when they mysteriously died a short time later. 
Not long after, Klimek began not feeling well himself. He told his brother John about his ailments, and John became suspicious. After his brother was rushed to the hospital, he notified the police. Joseph's doctors suspected arsenic poisoning. Lucky for Klimek, he survived, but Tilly was arrested after forensic tests confirmed the doctor's suspicions. When officers arrived at Tilly's apartment on October 27, 1921, she was taken into custody after a struggle. Tilly fought savagely against the police and injured several officers before she could be tossed into a patrol car. It's reported that as she was being driven away, she turned to one officer and said, the next one I want to cook a dinner for is you. You made all my trouble. Bodies of her other husbands were soon exhumed and found to contain lethal doses of arsenic. It also came to light that several relatives and neighbors had died unexpectedly as well. In all, investigators found 20 suspected victims, and 14 of them had died of arsenic poisoning. The press referred to Tilly as the Bluebeard of Chicago's Little Poland neighborhood. A circus-like atmosphere surrounded her trial. She strutted around, posed for the newspaper cameras, sneered at the prosecutor, and even made another prediction – that she would escape the gallows. And she did. She was found guilty of the murder of Frank Kupchak in March 1923 and sentenced to life in prison. Tilly was put to work in prison, although officials expressly ordered that she never be allowed to cook for her fellow inmates. She died behind bars November 20th, 1936. Up next, the batteries of numerous vehicles in a family's driveway all go dead at the same time. Plus, we'll take a look at a quadruple homicide that took place in Keddie, California. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode or Darkives episode every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. We've recently been tasked with moving into a new house. At the moment, we're right in the middle of building our own home, and unfortunately, though we are weeks off finishing, we've been told our lease won't be continuing and we have to move. In 20 days. Now, we put up an ad on Facebook for a short-term rental and have been lucky enough to find a house with a secure yard for the dogs, enough room for us, and close to my son's new school where he starts next week. So. First things first, we hired a skip bin. We have far too many things and we could almost downsize by half. What can be sold or donated has been set aside. The rest will go in the bin. The skip bin arrives and with it, something else. Over the next two days, we fill it to the brim. We're too busy during the day to notice anything off. At night, though, things just don't feel right. I tell my partner I keep seeing things out of the corner of my eye. Look around and there's nothing there. 
My partner works fly-in, fly-out FIFO, on a two-weeks-away, one-week-home roster. He flies back to site. That night, I walk out the door to put the garbage bins out. I have a rubbish bag in my hand. It's dusk, the sun has gone down, but there is still some twilight. As I open the door, I fleetingly see a dark shadow crouching by the skip bin. I look down to tie the bag, process what I've seen, and look back up. It stands up, walks two steps, and vanishes. I stop walking. The street light is on. It sits to the left of the skip bin. Weird. I'm a little freaked out, but put the bins out and go back inside. Later that night, while watching a movie, out of the corner of my eye, I see something walk past the theater room window. Look around, and there's nothing there. The dogs begin to get agitated outside, running up and down the yard, growling. This is very uncharacteristic for them. One of them never barks, and the other is a good guard dog but mostly a big goofball. The dogs are freaking me out more than anything else is. I bring them inside. They are my safety net when my partner's not home. They'll not leave the front of the house alone. Watching out the windows and looking at the skip, all night they're agitated. I don't get much sleep. A few days go by. I'm at work during the day, and aside from the dogs being agitated at night, I notice nothing else. Saturday comes, and I decide to take a trailer load of stuff over to the new house when I pick up the keys later. I pull the SUV out and hitch it up to the trailer. I've driven with the trailer before, but never done it all by myself. I pull it out from the backyard and back it into the driveway. I get it in on the first go. I'm so shuffed with myself that I backed the trailer in and on the first go. I load it up, tie it down, lock the cage, and I'm ready to go. Get in and flat battery. What? It was fine. It's a six-month-old battery. It's not cold. It's the middle of summer. Nothing left on. No reason for it to go dead. <sighs> no worries. We have a battery charger. Hook it up and let it charge. Thirty minutes later, I'm on the road. I park the trailer and then back the SUV into the driveway so I can jump it with my car if I have any more trouble. Sunday, my mom and sister are over to help me pack and do some cleaning. We spend the day doing just that. Then they have to go home. My mom goes to start her car in the driveway. And flat battery. Totally dead. I get my car out of the garage and jump start her car. We talk about how weird this is and can't work it out. My sister gets in her car. And flat battery. What the heck is going on here? I walk over to the SUV whose battery was perfect that morning when I started it. It, too, had a flat battery. We now have three out of the four cars at my home with dead batteries. I'm at a total loss to comprehend this. I just start my sister's car from my car and she's good to go. My mom leaves and I begin to back out from my spot directly facing my sister's car. I'm watching her as she begins to back out. She's looking in the mirror and suddenly smashes into the lamppost. I hear glass fall from the lamp to the road. It's difficult to explain how this happened, though. The look of shock on her face and the fact that she backed into the lamppost as if it simply wasn't there. I was watching her. I could see out her back window. The lamp could not be seen, yet it hit dead in the center of her bumper. Totally shocked, we both got out of our cars, run to the back of hers, and no damage. Not even a scratch. It was a hard hit. You heard the smash and the crunch, but no damage. I look at the lamp, dreading the amount of damage that it must have, and not a scratch. There's also no glass on the road. Nothing shattered onto the road, and yet we have both clearly heard it. My mom's battery was dead after she parked it at home. She got another battery installed. We had to replace the battery in the SUV as the life was sucked out of it. All batteries were less than a year old, and they all went dead. A few mornings later, I wake up with the indescribable feeling that I was being watched all night. 
I went to a little shop in town and bought some white sage and smudged the place. I felt better, but it did nothing. First time doing it, maybe I just didn't do it with enough conviction. I have to replace the bulbs in the bedside lamps because they keep flickering. Once I change them, they seem fine. One evening, the dogs are so freaked out that I'm starting to get very nervous. They typically tag team when on alert at night. They sleep in the bedroom with us. We have a Border Collie and a Dingo Mix Kelpie. The Border Collie has a big bark and will go off when he hears something. The Dingo usually comes and sits with me on the bed as if guarding me while the Border Collie sorts out business. The Border Collie goes off his nut, barking and whining, then starts growling. His hair stands up and he begins to bare his teeth. The Dingo gets up on the bed with me and whines. Her hair is standing up and she's baring her teeth. They're both looking at a spot in the corner of the room. I've bought white sage, essential oil, and made up a spray bottle of it. I go nuts around the room with it, and it seems to calm things down a bit. For a little while. The dogs go berserk a little later that evening. The skip bin was picked up a few nights later. It made no difference. My partner flew back home a few days later. I'm happy to say that whatever was there did not come with us when we moved. On the morning of April 12, 1981, Sheila Sharp returned to her home at Cabin 28 in the Ketty Resorts in California from the next-door neighbor's house. With the 14-year-old girl discovered inside the modest four-room cabin instantly became one of the most macabre scenes remembered in modern American crime history and has come to be known as the gruesome Ketty Murders. Inside Cabin 28, were the bodies of her mother, Glenna Sue Sharp, her teenage brother John, and his high school friend, Dana Wingate. The three had been bound by medical and electrical tape and had either been viciously stabbed, strangled, or bludgeoned. Sheila's sister, 12-year-old Tina Sharp, was nowhere to be found. Stranger still, in an adjoining bedroom, the two youngest Sharp boys, Ricky and Greg, as well as their friend and neighbor, 12-year-old Justin Smart, were found unharmed. They had apparently slept through the entire massacre, which had unfolded mere feet from their beds. The Sharp family had just moved into Cabin 28 the year before. Sue had just divorced her husband and brought her children from Connecticut to Ketty in Northern California. The six of them, 36-year-old Sue, her 15-year-old son, John, 14-year-old daughter Sheila, 12-year-old daughter Tina, and 10-year-old Rick and 5-year-old Greg were friendly with their nearby neighbors at the Ketty Resort. The night before the murders, Sheila had slept over at a friend's house down the street. John and his 17-year-old friend Dana had hitchhiked to a nearby town of Quincy for a party and returned sometime later that evening. Tina had briefly joined her sister at the neighbor's before returning home to her mother, two younger brothers, and one of the neighbor boys, Justin Smart. When Sheila returned home early the next morning to find her mother, brother, and his friend bloodied on the living room floor, she bolted back to her neighbor's house. Her friend's dad retrieved the three unharmed boys through their bedroom window so they would not have to see the scene. The murders had been notably violent, Investigators had been called out about an hour after Sheila had discovered her slain family. Deputy Hank Clement was the first to arrive on the scene, and he reported blood everywhere, on the walls, the bottoms of the victim's shoes, Sue's bare feet, the bedding in Tina's room, the furniture, the ceiling, the doors, and on the back steps. The prevalence of blood suggested to investigators that the victims had been moved and rearranged from the positions in which they were murdered. Fifteen-year-old John was closest to the front door, face up, his hands blood-covered and bound with medical tape. His throat had been slit. His friend Dana was on the floor beside him on his stomach. 
His head was badly damaged as though bashed in with a blunt object and lay partially on a pillow. He had been manually strangled. His ankles were tied with electrical wire, which was wound also around John's ankles so that the two were connected. Sheila's mother had been covered partially with a blanket, though that had done little to hide her gruesome injuries. On her side, the mother of five was naked from the waist down, tightly gagged with a bandana and her own underwear secured with medical tape. She had injuries consistent with a struggle and had an imprint of the butt of an 880 pellet gun on the side of her head. Like her son, her throat had been cut. All victims had suffered blunt force trauma. They all sustained multiple stab wounds. A bent steak knife was on the floor. A butcher knife and claw hammer, both also bloodied, were side by side on a small wooden table near the entry into the kitchen. It would take the police to realize that a fourth victim, Tina, was missing. When it was eventually discovered that Tina Sharp was missing, the FBI arrived on the scene. The sheriff at the time of the murders, Doug Thomas, and his deputy, Lieutenant Don Stoy, were not initially able to discern an apparent motive which made the murders at Kenny Cabin 28 seemingly random. The strangest thing is that there is no apparent motive. Any case without an apparent motive is the toughest to solve, Stoy recalled to the Sacramento Bee in 1987. Further, the home did not indicate forced entry, though detectives did recover an unidentified fingerprint from a handrail on the back stairs. The cabin's telephone had been left off the hook, and all of the lights had been shut off as well as the drapes closed. More confounding is that the three youngest boys were not only untouched but allegedly unaware of the event, even though a woman and her boyfriend in the cabin next door woke around 1.30 a.m. to what they described as muffled screams. Unable to discern from where they were coming, they went back to bed. However, though the three boys initially claimed to have slept through the massacre, Ricky and Greg's friend Justin Smart did later say that he saw Sue with two men in the house that night. One reportedly had a mustache and long hair, and the other clean-shaven with short hair. Both had glasses. One of the men had a hammer. Justin reported that then John and Dana entered the home and argued with the men, which resulted in a violent fight. Tina was then allegedly taken out the cabin's back door by one of the men. Allegedly, a lot of potential evidence was collected at the scene, but because this was pre-DNA testing, very little helpful information was found at this time. Sheriff Thomas called the Sacramento Department of Justice, which then sent in two special agents from their organized crime unit. Not homicide, which struck many as odd. Immediately, the two lead suspects were Justin Smart's father and the Sharp's neighbors, Martin Smart and his house guest ex-convict John Bo Bodeby, who was known to have connections to organized crime in the area. Both men had been seen in suits and ties behaving oddly in the bar the night before. Martin Smart later told the police that he had a hammer which matched the one discovered and also that his hammer had gone missing shortly before the murders. Later that year, a knife was recovered in a trash can outside the Keddy General Store. Authorities also believed this item to be linked to the crimes. It would be another three years after the Keddy murders that Tina was finally found. A man discovered a human skull in the adjoining Butte County, about 30 miles from Keddy in Plumas County. Near the remains, detectives also found a child's blanket, a blue nylon jacket, a pair of jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty surgical tape dispenser. With that, the remains of Tina Sharp had been found, which made the crimes committed on April 11th or 12th, 1981, a quadruple homicide. The Butte County Sheriff's Department was perplexed by the identity of the body until an anonymous call asked, I was wondering if they thought of the murder up in Ketty, up in Plumas County a couple years ago where a 12-year-old girl was never found. Meanwhile, Sheriff Thomas had resigned from the investigation three months in and taken a job instead at the Sacramento Department of Justice. 
His handling of the case, in retrospect, would be considered disastrous at best and corrupt at worst. I was told the suspects were told to get out of town, so to me that means it was covered up, Sheila Sharp told CBS Sacramento in 2016. The Sharps' home was demolished in 2004. Remarkably, the tape of the anonymous tip regarding Tina was found sealed in case files, untouched by Plumas County Sheriff's Department until 2013 when the case was reopened with new investigators Plumas Sheriff Greg Hagwood and Special Investigator Mike Gamberg. In 2016, Gamberg located a hammer, believed to be one of the murder weapons in a dried-up pond in Keddie. Further, it came to light that Marilyn Smart, Marty's wife and mother of Justin, had left her husband on the day of the murder discovery. Afterward, she provided Plumas County Sheriff's Department with a handwritten letter sent to her and signed by her estranged husband. It read, I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Great, what else do you want? This letter was not treated as a confession, nor was it followed up on at the time. Even though Marilyn admitted in a 2008 documentary that she thought her husband and his friend Bo were responsible, Sheriff Doug Thomas contradicted this and stated that Martin had successfully passed a polygraph test. It was later confirmed that Martin was close with the sheriff. In 2016, Gamberg met with a counselor at the Reno Veterans Administration. The anonymous counselor told him that in May of 1981, Martin Smart had confessed to killing Sue and Tina Sharp. I killed the woman and her daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys, he purportedly told the counselor. When the Department of Justice was alerted to this confession in 1981, they dismissed it as hearsay. The most widely accepted theory involves a love triangle between Martin, Marilyn, and Sue. It was believed that Martin and Sue were having an affair, and that Sue was supposedly counseling Marilyn to leave her husband, who she said was abusive to her. When Martin discovered this, he enlisted Bo, his friend, and known mob enforcer who had lived with the Smarts a mere ten days before the Ketty murders, to take Sue out of the picture. This would account for Marilyn's leaving her husband the day of the murder discovery. It would also explain why the smart boy and the other sharp boys in the adjoining room were spared. Additionally, it gives context to Martin's handwritten note that Marilyn gave to the Plumas Sheriff's Department. Some investigators who picked up the case when it reopened in 2013 tie the slayings into an even larger plot. To Gamberg, it's clear that the Department of Justice and Thomas Run Sheriff's Department covered it up. It's the way it sounds. He alleges that Bo and Martin fit into a larger drug smuggling scheme which involved the federal government. Martin was a known drug dealer, and Bo was connected to Chicago crime syndicates with financial interests in drug distribution. This might explain why the Sacramento Department of Justice sent two allegedly corrupt organized crime special agents instead of agents from the Homicide Department. It also provides an explanation as to why the two lead suspects were seemingly given a free pass and told to leave town by Sheriff Thomas. Furthermore, it suggests an answer as to why this case was handled so sloppily, remains unsolved, and is seemingly not a priority to the Sacramento Department of Justice. What is known is that this 38-year-old crime is far from a cold case, as new evidence sheds light on what may have occurred at Cabin 28 in Keddy, California. Although both Martin Smart and Bo Budabay are now deceased, New DNA evidence has pointed investigators to other suspects who may have had a hand in these murders and who are still alive. It's my belief that there were more than two people who were involved in the totality of the crime, the disposal of the evidence, and the abduction of the little girl, said Hagwood. We are convinced that there are a handful of people that fit those roles who are still alive. When Weird Darkness returns, extraterrestrials and the government. 
You can't have one without the other. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Serving as an object lesson to us all, towards the finale of the classic 1950s sci-fi film The Day the Earth Stood Still, in which an alien spacecraft lands in an American city park, the line of dialogue, Klaatu Baradanito, uttered by the heroine, saves the Earth. By using this phrase from an alien language taught to her by the hero, an alien but human-looking ambassador from the spacecraft, the heroine instructs a robotic enforcer-slash-bodyguard-slash-policeman called Gort to rescue and reanimate his by now dying charge – that is, the ambassador – instead of systematically laying waste to the entire planet. The film ends with an impassioned farewell speech, delivered from the rim of the saucer by the altruistic ambassador prior to his departure, earnestly pleading with us to abandon our aggressive tendencies intercene rivalries and, most importantly, the nuclear arms race, and live in harmony. The film was very much of its era and reflected the bone-chilling paranoia and fear generated by the Cold War. It was also admirably demonstrated that if we cannot coerce, defeat, or understand something, we must of necessity fear and, if possible, destroy it. Sadly, over time, and irrespective of how much we learn, very little changes, except that we become even more proficient at killing one another. One thing that sets the events depicted in the film apart from run-of-the-mill accounts of other paranormal events – and make no mistake about it, ufology is exactly that – a manifestation of the paranormal was its malleability to the needs of government bodies. While this is especially true of the almost obsessive, labyrinthine secrecy of the military machine, it is also an accepted fact that the United Kingdom possesses, in spite of claims to the contrary, one of the most secretive governments in the free world. However, even with this ingrained culture of secrecy, there are pockets of reticence that beggar belief and the obfuscation and lies concerning the events of Rendlesham are a case in point. Even the much-needed, recently introduced and high-profile British Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, is currently being watered down to conceal the misdoings and incompetence of government ministers and the sheer scale of waste and inefficiency that occurs within officialdom. The intense secrecy over the past and present misdeeds of the House of Windsor is yet another example of this mania for concealment. However, while all countries have secrets that, in the interests of national security, require to be kept under wraps, there are some secrets that can be deliberately molded to serve a variety of purposes. This is particularly true of the large-scale use of reported UFO sightings to conceal the development of very real, cutting-edge weapons technology from a variety of sources. The worst offender was undoubtedly the government of the United States of America, who concealed an entire generation of stealth aircraft from the public gaze by promoting, and to some extent encouraging, the belief in extraterrestrial spacecraft. The system was simple – drip-feed a subtle blend of half-truth and lies to gullible and credulous dupes, then stand back and watch the disinformation solidify into hard facts, 
facts that had the dual benefit of discrediting both the reputations of the person promoting them and, by implication, the entire subject of UFO research. The system of disinformation was repeatedly used to good effect on the Soviet Union, although in fairness they were also masters of this arcane art, especially in the early days of the Cold War, when they managed to convince the USA that they were far more advanced in their long-range strategic bomber capability than they actually were. This, of course, caused the U.S. government to channel prodigious sums of money into its arms-related space and weapons programs, which resulted in the first moon landing in 1969. Whether or not the moon landings actually took place is, for the present, neither here nor there. Neither is what was allegedly witnessed during the flights and the excursions on the surface of the moon. What is important is what was learned from it. We can only hope that the upcoming planned manned mission to Mars capitalizes on the lessons learned and is successful, and many of the enigmas associated with this most enigmatic planet are revealed. We can only hope. The reason that cutting-edge space projects were curtailed, and to a large extent still are, was not entirely due to a lack of funding but rather for safety reasons. The flights leading up to and including the Apollo project were horrendous affairs that imposed such intolerable levels of risk and danger upon the crews that they simply would no longer be countenanced. The courage of the astronauts was truly remarkable. Little wonder that some of them went a little bit offline afterwards. However, at the time, for political expediency, the safety fears were to a large extent either played down or brazenly denied. Among other factors, it's been stated publicly that the level of computer technology used on board Apollo 11 was unreliable and technologically similar to a hybrid between a digital watch and a mobile phone, but probably closer to the digital watch. In fact, it has now been admitted by those who were part of the space program at the time the computers used both on board the spacecraft and at mission control were in fact data loggers rather than what we now think of as state-of-the-art computers. From the acres of print created, the hundreds of books written, and the myriad theories espoused on the subject of ufology and supposedly alien spacecraft, one thing in particular stands out. In spite of bold claims to the contrary, there was absolutely no consensus on their point of origin. Alternately, attributed to paranormal, social and cultural phenomena, and even visitors from other star systems and dimensions, just what they are or are not is still, as always, open to conjecture. During the halcyon, heady days between 1950s and the early 1990s, the entire subject was a happy hunting ground for liars, charlatans, and the deluded. However, to be fair, the subject is one that by its very nature readily lends itself to manipulation, not only by the lunatic fringe but, as we shall see, official bodies too. Not least among the difficulties facing the genuine researcher is getting one basic fact across to the general public, and that is, a UFO is not necessarily an alien spacecraft crewed by extraterrestrials. The average run of the mill reports on UFOs were, and still are, easily explained away through more prosaic reasons, vis-a-vis -vis aircraft, both civilian and military, satellites, meteors, stars, planets, temperature inversions, and, to a large extent, sheer wishful thinking. There is, however, a harder core of sightings, both by the naked eye and on radar, which cannot be dismissed so easily, and a good number of these are almost certain to be very highly classified experimental aircraft. There is little percentage in getting excited about sightings of prototype aircraft since, other than personal satisfaction, all governments will resolutely deny all knowledge of them. Frankly, it would be surprising if they did not. This instinctive, official denial may actually have some validity, since deep black projects fielded by one country are unlikely to appear in official reports of even friendly powers. In fact, the intelligence community may be genuinely unaware of them. The rather curious type of mania of attempting to identify top-secret military hardware also extends to the group of ufologists who continually try to prove the existence of secret military underground bases. 
RAF Rudlow Manor is a prime but by no means lone example. The implication is usually that these bases are monitoring points to track UFOs, not only across British airspace but as part of a worldwide network. This is not surprising. Of course, there are secret underground bases. In fact, it would be far more surprising if there were not. It may be uncomfortable, but in this increasingly paranoid world, these and other covert measures are necessary to maintain our national security. Whether or not they are used to track and monitor UFOs, or anything else that invades our airspace, is a matter for speculation. But on balance, I'm quite certain that they are. There's no intention to detract from the work already done researching these bases, but since the bases are manifestly there and their existence will be continually and categorically denied, why don't the researchers involved in this subject turn their undoubted talents to ultimately more rewarding areas, the prime subject of this being ufology in its own right? Serious researchers in the field have had a largely uphill struggle to get themselves heard above the agendas of self-promoting grandstanders, media junkies, and so-called UFO experts, which is in itself a peculiar expression. What exactly is a UFO expert? In spite of claims to the contrary, there are no UFO experts. None. If there is no consensus, then how can there be experts? This is about as valid as someone calling themselves an expert on balloon farming on Venus. However, as long as there are tabloid newspapers and late-night talk shows with a wad of cash to spend and a desire to trivialize possibly important information, then self-styled UFO experts will continue to appear and proliferate. Fortunately, ufology is not just confined to one particular geographical area or country, but it is spread around the world, and the majority of sightings tend to be centered on areas of military activity. This is perhaps stating the obvious, but it is not exactly surprising given the nature of the clandestine projects often carried out there. The main problem here is attempting to tell the difference between covert military aircraft overflying the base and alleged scrutiny by extraterrestrials. The grandfather of all military bases is, of course, the notorious Area 51, a part of the gargantuan Edwards Air Force Base which incorporates the Groom Lake Test Range and covers an area about the size of Wales in the UK. Unsurprisingly, the US government still robustly denies the existence of the facility, although accounts of what has regularly been seen in the skies above the airbase are legion. Again, we must remember what this base is all about, i.e. the testing of highly secret prototype military aircraft and, as such, a magnet for snoops and spies, both human and allegedly alien. I must confess that I, I don't know why ET spies would want to keep an eye on our, in their terms, rather backward technology, whether cobbled up and back-engineered from their wrecked craft or not. Surely, if they did not wish their technology to be used by us, then they should be more than able to mount a retrieval. We as a species often fail to do ourselves justice in terms of our own capabilities. This may contribute to our willingness to attribute extraterrestrials' origins to our own cutting-edge technology. It's also odd that for some reason we're apparently only interested in devising flying machines and not exploiting any of the other, and perhaps more useful, technologies, which these craft would presumably contain. There have been a few theories regarding what may or may not have been done in this field of alleged adapted and back-engineered technology. Transistors, fiber optics, and stealth capabilities are a few of them, dubious and disprovable claims made in Major Donald Corso's book The Day After Roswell. The type of maneuvers performed by these aircraft, as described by eyewitnesses, is evidently quite extraordinary whizzing around at breathtaking speed, pulling amazing high-G turns, apparently stopping dead in the sky only to race off in another direction in a manner that would leave the pilot smeared like a bloody pulp over his cockpit. Although this is what would happen if there was a pilot aboard, most likely there's not. What has been seen there are almost certainly experimental, 
pilotless aircraft, drones guided from the ground, of which Have Blue was an early example and flown by technicians using a form of virtual reality remote control. We have the materials, techniques, and capabilities to design and build aircraft that, in terms of durability and handling, far outstrip the physical ability of pilots to fly them to the limits of their design envelopes. So why bother with pilots at all? Why not just build a smarter missile? They fly far faster than piloted aircraft, and using satellite guidance can hit targets with incredible accuracy. They see in the dark or through thick fog and can discriminate between houses and vehicles. They don't get tired and they don't have to eat or sleep. On the downside, missiles have no common sense and, vitally, no compassion or humanity. Pilots, on the other hand, do or should do. If nothing else, they could abort or modify a mission on humanitarian grounds. Unfortunately, future wars will, rightly or wrongly, eventually be fought using this type of technology. This, then, is one totally feasible and believable explanation for what has been and still is seen over Area 51. The alternative explanation to this, of course, is that what's actually being witnessed is the test flying of piloted vehicles, back-engineered from the alien craft allegedly retrieved over the years from various crash sites in the USA and other countries. These black projects have allegedly been going on since the 1940s in an attempt to utilize a technology that is still far in advance of our own. Well, perhaps, but there are no clear examples of this. If it was the case, why have we seen no evidence to support that theory? In the Gulf War and the subsequent conflict in Iraq, there was technology aplenty – Patriot missiles, stealth fighters and bombers, spy satellites – everything, in fact, except for some show of alien technology. This could not have been kept hidden so effectively for so long. In fact, today, why keep it hidden at all? Are we to believe in all seriousness that our race, a relatively sophisticated and nominally civilized society, couldn't handle the reality of beings from another planet being here with us? Are we so arrogant that we think that we are the only life forms in the entire universe? No, not arrogant, perhaps, but almost certainly afraid, especially if we thought that the supposed race was much superior to us. This also begs the question, superior in what way? Technologically? Physically? Mentally? Spiritually or a combination of these attributes? Human nature, being what it is, in the event of a meeting, there would be a period of uncertainty accompanied by the predictable ranting of religious fundamentalists and xenophobic minorities. It would, of course, rather depend on what the extraterrestrials looked like. Providing they were reasonably humanoid and not too alarming in appearance, like the Nordic variety preferably, it is a fair assumption that they would be accepted fairly quickly. On the other hand, if they were not and resembled giant spiders or had waving tentacles, they would be assumed to represent a menace to the human race. This would probably involve a return to the paranoia expressed in sci-fi films over the years. For example, The Day the Earth Stood Still, The War of the Worlds, and Independence Day. All these films expressed different viewpoints. In one instance, i.e. The War of the Worlds, the evil tentacled aliens were eventually laid low by humble terrestrial bacteria. In another, as we saw at the beginning of the article, the ignorance, fear displayed by the population and military of, in this case the USA, created havoc when friendly overtures on the part of the alien were misunderstood. He tried to demonstrate a gift and was shot for his pains. Finally, in Independence Day, we had a return to sheer, the tub-thumping gung-ho heroics of yesteryear and the overthrow of an unpleasant alien species by the combined wiles and selfless heroism of a few brave men. Fiction? Yes, but does this indicate a deep, instinctive reaction to a perceived threat? Or is there a much more subtle agenda at work here? Are we perhaps being prepared and acclimated for something? 
Perhaps the process of preparation has already begun with the steady introduction of the population to the idea of contact with another race or races using the medium of television and outlets. It would make a lot of sense to do it by this method, given the impact that television and the media in general have on our lives. If this was the case, to present the ETs as warlike or aloof would be a grave mistake, which is why the majority of blockbuster films, with a few exceptions, tend to be more cerebral. Given time, I'm sure that we would eventually come to accept their presence here, and hopefully an atmosphere of mutual trust would develop. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Chicago's constant widow, Tilly Klimek, was written by Troy Taylor. Dead Battery is by Sunset Sister. The Quadruple Homicide at Cabin 28 is by Ted Kammerer. The Politics of the UFO is by Brian Allen. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Mark 6, verses 49 and 50. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And a final thought. Our bodies will grow old, but great memories will keep us young. Willie Nye Winning. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs> <laughs>